This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV. The Kia EV9. With available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults. With a zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute. And available reclining lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk again with Dr. Eric Russell, HCI Research Associate, as we continue our weekly discussions on various aspects of servant leadership. This week, we focus our discussion on the importance of awareness today, awareness of self, of others, and situational as it pertains to leadership in organizations. Dr. Eric Russell, welcome to the Human Capital Innovation Podcast. Great to be here. It's always good to see you, my friend, and it's great to continue our weekly servant leadership series where we discuss different aspects of servant leadership and different principles and concepts that are really key and foundational to what servant leadership is all about. Today, we're going to be talking about the importance of awareness, uh, awareness of self, others, and situational as it pertains to leadership and organizations. Uh, and I'm really excited for the discussion. Uh, for <coughs> listeners uh, who may not remember or who haven't um, had a chance to, to listen to previous uh, episodes in the Servant Leadership Series, uh, we've now had several uh, opportunities to, to have a discussion. And uh, Dr. Eric Russell is uh, a professor of emergency services at Utah Valley University, and he's an HCI research associate. And it's always great to have a chance uh, to talk with you, Eric. So again, welcome. And uh, I'm excited to discuss the importance of awareness. Excellent. Yeah, that's a great topic to talk about something uh, a lot of people lack. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, so as we begin, let's let's start there. So it's, it's important. I think most people would say, yeah, being aware of your surroundings, being aware of yourself and others, that's important. Um, but it's, it's, it goes beyond being important. It's, it's essential. It's vital. Um, and so many people lack the ability to have kind of a, a presence and awareness in the moment and with who they're interacting with. Um, so in your mind, why is it essential and a, and a critical part of servant leadership? So awareness is essential. You have to go back to our primal selves, right? So you, you got to figure we, we as human beings will see a snake even before a dog will see a snake. It's our whole survival kind of, kind of thing. Our awareness is, is what's kept us around and, um, and has taken us for the mo most part, if you're lucky enough, out of the food chain. If you don't go back in the ocean, most likely you're never back in the food chain as a human being. Um, but our awareness is our survival. And from an organization standpoint, your awareness is your survival of your organization. But it's also your awareness is your care for your people. Um, and your awareness is how you deal with other people because you're aware of yourself as well. There's that great meme that's going around now. It's mean, I guess, but they call in like angry white women, Karen. Do you know that? Have you heard that? Uh, yeah. And I, I'm not quite yeah. sure of the origin, uh, but I've definitely heard that. Yeah. But one of those things, when you watch some of the videos that are online, they'll, they'll throw it out. And like my nieces have showed me some of these videos and things like that is 
it's usually people that are completely unaware of themselves. They're aware of how they're coming across to others or they're unaware. And they're just, un it's almost like their emotional intelligence um, is, is that of a three-year-old. They, they have no self-awareness whatsoever and they come across as horrible people. You can also tell that there's probably something wrong with a lot of these people. Um, Maybe they're having their own type of a crisis, but awareness is awareness is so important because it's how we come across, it's how we see the world, and it's how we survive. And when Greenleaf came up with the concept of servant leadership, he said that the servant leader is um, reasonably disturbed at all times because you're always aware, you know. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's um, particularly interesting within our current socio-political context and the the strife, the Black Lives Matters um, movement right now, and and all of these surrounding elements. It especially when you come from a place of privilege, it's uncomfortable to be aware of these challenging issues. So someone who who, you know, say a middle-aged white man like me, you know, um, if I'm unaware of these types of issues and I'm unaware of the plight of, um, of black men, you know, and the fear that they have as they walk down the street that, you know, something could happen to them, um, or I'm unaware of the, uh, the plight of women in the workforce who have to deal with discrimination on a regular basis, or... LGBTQ and in individuals in the types of discrimination they face when if if I if I have my blinders on because of my privilege and it's not necessarily intentional right it's it's just implicit bias it's 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 just my way of life I so I'm not necessarily saying these people are horrible people it's just the nature of privilege so if I'm walking around with my privilege and I'm unaware and oblivious to these things and then I become aware the awareness is forced upon me it's thrust upon me due to things like the George Floyd death and Black Lives, Lives Matter protests, all of a sudden, now I'm in a situation where I am aware and it's incredibly uncomfortable <laughs> um, because I, now I have to, to uh, look myself in the mirror and I have to reconcile my privilege with the experience of others who maybe are, are dealing with really hard things. And it can become exhausting and the interesting part to that, though, and related back to what you were just saying, is, yeah, it's, it's tiring, it's exhausting, awareness is a burden, but it's also, we have to recognize that's a burden that has always been there for these other minority groups. We have just been free of that burden because of our unawareness. <laughs> yeah. And once we're now aware, now that, that, that um, veil of, of of unawareness has been removed, and we have no choice if we're going to be decent human beings to now confront these complicated, disturbing issues and to to be part of the fight towards re uh, resolving them. Right, and that's not easy work. That's really hard work. That's hard. Um, that's hard emotionally. It's taxing. But those who don't have the privilege that we have. They, they fight that fight every day. They, that's their life. Um, and they, they carry that burden with them. And so we need to look for ways to help carry that burden. And that, that's, I think, what awareness is about. And I think that's what you were referring to about how it's exhausting. It's tiring. It's, it is a burden, but it's a necessary uh, burden if you're truly going to seek out how you can better lift up and serve those around you. Yeah. Well, if everybody, you know, if everybody starts falling to zero, right, and you just keep having more and more people lose their jobs, more and more people get abused by the system, more and more people fall out of the world, what the hell do you think is going to happen? You know, you think they're just going to, you think they're just going to walk away into the sunset? No, we have to be aware of the of fact that I like privilege. I assign privilege far more to socioeconomic status than I do to anything else. And I think one of the things that's getting lost in this awareness culture right now is the fact that people don't realize that when you're poor, you have no justice, you have no voice, you have no say. 
It's one of the reasons why you have all of these people out of work, but the vast majority of them make less than $40,000 a year and the stock market's at record high. And it's because you have to finally come to terms with the fact that the poor don't matter. They don't matter to anybody. You'd be hard pressed to find somebody who was killed by the cops that made a six figure income. You'd be hard pressed to find somebody killed by police officers that had a master's degree. It, it, really is, it really is an awareness for the most vulnerable in society, which is the, the very working class and the poor. And we can say it by race and everything, but it really is about poverty. It's about people being, it's about people being poor and it's about being aware of this kind of stuff. You know, I'm 6'5". I'm white. I'm heterosexual. Um, I don't ever have to be aware of who I am when I walk into a room. But my friends do. My friends who are persons of color, my friends who are trans, they are very much aware of who they are and constantly scanning the environment when they walk into a room because they don't know where the hell the threat's coming from. One of my favorite things to tell people to go watch, and I'm a huge stand-up comic fan. Like, I love stand-up comedy. I think it's probably one of the best forms of entertainment in my, in my mind is there's a show that Jerry Seinfeld does called Comedians and Cause Getting Coffee. I love and that one of these episodes he does is with Chris Rock. And as they're driving in this six-figure car, Chris Rock is about as famous as you can get. He's about as rich as you can get. He's balling. Jerry Seinfeld's balling. All of a sudden, they're rolling down the road and a cop car is behind and the cameras in the, are in the vehicle. They're filming the faces of both Chris Rock and Jerry Seinfeld. And here's Chris Rock, an international superstar, one of the greatest, greatest comedians to ever live. And you can literally watch his body language and his face change as soon as he realizes the cops are behind him. He became physically, outwardly scared. And Jerry Seinfeld even asked him about it. He's like, dude, I'm a black man. And it's like, this is Chris Rock. And you could, and he wasn't this, there was no acting in this. He physically became scared. And so if that's happening and we know it and we can see it in our people that we put on pedestals, our celebrities, then we know that we have a problem. We're now aware of that problem. So then the question is, is what are we going to do about it? What are we as a society, what are we as an organization is going to do about it? The pushback against all of this stuff, like when somebody says Black Lives Matter and somebody says All Lives Matter, um, is the people that are saying All Lives Matter, they don't realize the fact that these problems really exist. Like the, 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 the problem of inequity really exists. The problem of racial bias really exists. And like you, once you're aware of it, now you have a responsibility to do something about it. And nobody on these sides, nobody on these sides is saying, I want to take you, John, and I want to take away from you and your family in order to give to this other person. They're not saying that. The vast majority of people, 99.9% .9 of people are saying, listen, all we want is to be able to experience the world the way you're experiencing it. You know, I've said it in a prior talk. It was Van Jones who said, what am I supposed to do? Dress my kids up in tuxedos? White people don't think about that, especially affluent. Poor white people do. Poor white people do because their kids, their kids slide into the, the same problems that, that other people's kids do too. But affluent, upper middle class, white people never think, well, when my son leaves the house with his shaggy hair and his T-shirt, they're never like, is somebody going to judge him and drop the hammer on him or take him to jail? They're not. They're not. That kid gets to leave the house and never, never – does that kid ever have to be aware of, of, of who he is? And that, yeah, awareness, and that awareness matters. Yeah, and you've pointed out there really are layers um, to this privilege, right? And socioeconomic is a huge factor. Um, you know, so, someone who's, let's say, a, a poor uh, black trans uh, uh, woman, it, that's like layer upon layer upon layer of, of oh yeah of issues that they're going to have to be dealing with um and and one of the things that gets lost in this discussion of privilege some people really 
uh, get defensive when, when it's brought up, mm -hmm. it's, it's not claiming that your life hasn't been hard. Um, you know, I'm a nope. white man. I've had my challenges just like other people have had challenges. But what I can confidently say as I'm self-aware is that I haven't had the same challenges as say a poor black person. Uh, I don't have the same fear that they have. I've had other ish challenges. I've had other struggles. I've, you know, life isn't easy for anybody. So, you know, there, there are, everyone has their own struggles. Nobody's saying that they don't. Um, nobody's saying that blue lives don't matter um, or all lives don't matter. They're just saying right now in this moment, it's an opportunity for us to be aware of uh, inequities in a system that disproportionately hurt black lives, for example. Um, and we're talking really macro right now. We're talking about the, this big social issue, but this applies within ourselves and our own leadership. It applies within the workplace. Also, because we have structures um, that exist within the workplace and how the policies, practices, and procedures and how they're, they're how they manifest and the mechanisms within organizations that disproportionately at times hurt individuals um, of different backgrounds. Uh, it doesn't ne necessarily need to be race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or, or the like. It, it can be a whole range of things. But the, the bottom line is, unless we are aware of the challenges of the disenfranchised and, and the underrepresented individual, um, then we can't fight for justice for them. We can't fight for equity and fairness within our, our systems, whether it's organizational or social, and, and we can't help improve things. And that's the whole point. And that's why there's a burden on us once we become aware. When we're aware and we start to see, when you, when you kind of have that veil taken away, you can't help but see it. And then you start to see the, the inequities all around you. And that, that is a burden, but it also is an opportunity because then it provides you um, with the, at least a level of understanding and a desire to, to help others that will allow you to make a difference. And that's, that's what, you know, coming back to servant leadership, that's why it's so vital is it's, it's hard to truly be an empathetic, um, other centered leader if you're not actually aware of the plight and the needs of the people around you. Yes. It, you know, if, if I, if I walk around thinking everyone's life experience is just like it is for me as a middle-aged white man, um, you know, I'm going to be missing a huge part of the life experience and the needs and desires, the challenges of, of the people that I'm leading and serving. And I'm not going to be an effective leader because of that. Right. Right. And it doesn't take much. Like when I'm working with people or I'm talking about servant leadership or I'm writing on it and I put, I am not ever saying that there has to be this dramatic change it doesn't take much to go oh all right so it is a little bit different for you it is a little bit different for you know we're all in a meeting in a room and let's say you have um one female that works on your team and you're all in this meeting and everybody's talking and then they're like all right take a break everybody goes to the bathroom well everybody continues to talk in that bathroom except for her okay and when you when you're when you ignore that and you and you want to pretend that that once you're aware of it the only way the only way to not see it anymore is you have to pretend it doesn't exist even though you know like you you know these things don't exist you know that if you have certain artwork okay in let's say you are a public servant and you are a, a high level public servant all right and you have certain artwork that exists in your city, county, state, federal building, and it depicts the Confederacy. If it if it depicts individuals that did horrific thing to First Nations people, you have to understand that when you when they walk by it, their experience is completely different from yours. And if you don't want to be aware of something like that and you want to pretend that that doesn't exist, well, those wounds are still going to be there. You know, nobody really gives a damn that a statue of Andrew Jackson stands across from the White House. 
what that is, is, is that's people trying to point out the fact that we're not trying to erase our history. We just need to stop putting this stuff into perspective because the, that history to this group is completely different from that history to this group. And if we would just acknowledge that, we wouldn't be where we are today. And that's the thing. We, we're to protest in the streets, groups like Black Lives Matter needing to exist, statues being torn down, graffiti going up on these things, artwork being pulled out because we, we just refuse to see. And this is a festering wound. This is a couple who for the last five years, they got married at 18. They never had open, they never had open dialogue. And now all of a sudden, five years later, every single one of their problems is now blowing up all at once. And it's because we never wanted to pretend, we never wanted to see that those problems existed. And I don't understand why, why it's difficult. I don't, why, I don't understand why we had to get to this place of not giving a damn about each other and not seeing each other for who we are and just acknowledging it and being like, yeah, I get it. I get it. I, I don't understand why we've allowed to get to this point. Like if you have a military base named after a Confederate general as a white, I mean, I never noticed Fort Bragg. I never even thought about it. But if I was an African-American growing up in the South, I'd be like, hmm, I know what that is. I know what that name is. So I, and I'm saying that I never even thought about it. But when it's brought to our attention, our first reaction is, is we're trying to rewrite history. And it's like, no, 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 no. I don't believe that at all. I believe that the vast majority are not trying to rewrite history. I believe that the vast majority are just trying to put, they're trying to put the right, the right story on history. Like nobody's saying that George Washington wasn't the first president. Nobody's saying that George Washington wasn't a revolutionary. Nobody's saying that he wasn't a major important figure. But we also have to acknowledge the fact that he owned human beings. And we can say, well, it was a different time. Yeah, it was. But you know what? Now is not. And so if we're not going to, if we're not going to acknowledge the greatness and the faults, and we're just going to create deities out of these people, well, then marginalized groups in our society are going to take that personally, which they should. Like, I've been thinking, how could you possibly offend me? Like, what could you say? Like, what words could you call me to even offend me at all? What kind of a statue could you put up? And the answer is, is there's nothing. Nothing. There's nothing that would make me feel like less of a human being and less of a citizen. Nothing. But to others, to our brothers and sisters of color, to our brothers and sisters in the LGBTQ community, yeah, there is. There's things that we can do to make them feel like less of a human being. And when we become aware of that, it matters. And for organizational leaders, it is vitally important that you build organizations and you lead organizations that recognize the fact that everybody's, everybody's journey is different. And there's really cruel things that happen to people that you're not even aware of. So let's talk about that. So how, and I, I think in part of what you're saying, you know, why, why did we let it get to this? Um, how do we let this happen? Why, why is our first reaction, not, not universally of everyone, but generally speaking, why is the first reaction of someone when they become aware of something really hard in their history or the social context around them, um, and they become aware, why is their first reaction often defensiveness? Um, and it's it's because we're insecure. It's because we 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 whether we we know it in the front of our brain or not, you know, in 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 our subconscious, we're we're scared that our privilege will be challenged, and that if if a focus then turns to someone else who's disadvantaged, and they then uh, obtain greater equity uh, in the system, that somehow that will diminish us. That's a faulty frame of thinking, I believe. But I think mm -hmm. that's the human nature reaction that people have. And it takes, it takes some training to peel away the layers uh, in, in allowing ourselves to truly embrace the discomfort, um, you know, of, of these newfound truths. And, that, you know, I, I think everyone goes through that to a certain extent throughout their lives. And some people 
you know, kind of embrace the complexity and ambiguity and they kind of learn and grow with it. And other people kind of retreat back and they put their head in the sand and they, they, they just, they just want the world to be the way that they understood it previously. And, and that's why we see the, the vastly different approaches. So anyways, with, with that said, what, what do we do if, if we're in an organization and like your example of the woman in the meeting was a great one. We know that women in meetings, there's lots of research that shows, you know, there's lots of subtle ways that they are undermined in meetings, men talking over them, um, men taking credit for their ideas. You know, they'll say an idea and then nobody pays attention. And then five minutes later, a man says the same idea and everyone's like, that's wonderful. You know, so these types of things happen all the time. And a lot of times they're very subtle. A lot of times they're unintentional, uh, but it's just the implicit bias of the people in the room. Um, how do we help break that down? How do we help um, leaders and our coworkers and ourselves be open to greater awareness? Uh, how do we help people see the necessity? How do we help people, like what, what tools are out there to help people become more aware so that they can make positive steps forward? I think that's an excellent question. I think it all has to go back. You know me, I'm a big economic individual benefit kind of a guy. I believe that you have to appeal to the self-interest of others. And in a lot of my work that I put out there, I talk about servant leadership cycle of benefit, the, the, the benefit to self, the benefit to others, the benefit to the organization. And I say that there is a rational self-interest in being a servant leader. And I've proven it. Well, I haven't proved it. But I've shown it in research by working with C-suite leaders and, and, have, and have actually had that stuff published in journals. People have to stop realizing that it is in your best interest, your self-interest in your own preservation, that you become aware of these things and that you work towards improving them. And we can get into those steps and we'll talk about those in other talks as well, as far as like listening and empathy, we've talked to, you know, and, and really get, really get into that stuff. But it all starts with the fact that there's no benefit to police officers to have people who put their knees on necks of restrained men of color. None, none. It puts the lives of these officers in danger it makes their job suck even more. You know, there is a rational, selfish benefit to improving community policing. There is a rational, selfish benefit to improving your organization and becoming far more inclusive of people and recognizing and appreciating the differences of people. We're not trying to turn this into you know, everybody's going to be the exact same. That's horrible because you won't, you actually won't get a nice, decent amount of ideas coming in. If everybody thinks the same and acts the same and walks and talks the same, then guess what? Your organization isn't going to be successful. And so I believe it starts with what Adam Smith talked about in the wealth of nations. I believe it starts with making people who we would say for lack of a better term, have the privilege realize that it is in your best interest to not have the most vulnerable in our population and the most marginalized in our population to continue to be vulnerable and marginalized. It's in your best interest as a company. It's in your best interest as a police officer. It's in your best interest as a university. We can't keep going this way. Because of the changes that are coming to our world through artificial intelligence and technology more and more people over time are going to stop falling towards that zero we have to be open and honest about that and say it is not in our best interest you can't go hide behind your gated communities and put up your black lives matter sign and show support and solidarity from your summer home in the mountains okay it's not going to work anymore it's been proven in the Russian Revolution. It's been proven in the French Revolution. It's been proven. It's been proven in, 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 in the Maoist in the Maoist movements. We've seen it. 
when too many people hit zero, when too many people starve, when too many people become disenfranchised and pushed out, well, that's when revolutions happen. And I believe that the, the first thing that we do is we get people to see that it is in nobody's best interest, but some of these charities to have this many poor and disenfranchised people. And it's certainly not in your best interest as an organizational leader to have people feeling less than in your organization. Because what we found like in Tons, the good job strategy, uh, she's out of MIT. I think it's one of the best books that's been written in a, in a very long time. She's shown how when we take care of the needs of people, the companies that do this, instead of we're cutting benefits, we're cutting 401ks, we're cutting medical, we're cutting this, we're cutting that, we're laying you off. The companies that don't do that in the long run, they benefit more, they make more money, and they're more successful. Okay? And I believe that same thing has to happen when it comes to our people. That if you're not going to, in, it's in your self-interest to invest in this understanding, to become aware of the differences of people and to celebrate them. Because if, if you're talking about a marketing campaign for your, let's say your product, well, people from diverse backgrounds, they're going to have, they're going to have a completely different look at a product. And they're also going to be able to market this better because you could have one marketing campaign this way, another marketing campaign this way. But if you have a bunch of, let's say just white men who all went to Wharton and they're all sitting around the room. Well, they don't have that diverse view. They just don't. And so again, you're going to make more money. It really is. I think the only way to fix this, and this, this is just Eric Russell speaking and I'm pulling it out of my butt, but I believe that the only way to fix this is you have to show that becoming aware of this stuff and working towards improving it and making it better for everybody and getting everybody in equal, an equal playing field. Okay. Nobody's, nobody's saying, you know, a quality of outcome. They're saying, listen, we just need a, a, a quality of existence. We just need to all be on this, this playing field. It is in your best interest to do it. And I think the only way to get people to change is to appeal to, to their self-interest. And, 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 we're go, and if we go about it that way, then I think we can really be successful at this. But if we play on emotion, it never works because emotions die out. They become Cuban crimes of passion. You know, it's like it'll last for a week and then it just moves on. It, ha it has to be an economic plea. It has to be a plea for the, the best interest of others. That to me yeah. is the way that you get this to work. Yeah. And I, I think another way of saying what you just said is for organizations, for leaders, we have to make the business case for why inclusion and diversity yes. is important, right? Yes, that's well and, said. And, you know, as much as I would love for everyone, for organizations to just be socially minded, social impact driven, pur purpose driven organizations, valuing people and treating everyone equally with dignity and respect, as much as I would like everyone to just do that because of their own intrinsic motivations, I also am not foolish enough to, to, to believe that that will happen. Like there, there have to be structures and mechanisms put in place and you have to be able to um, create a compelling business case for why these things are important. Luckily, there is a compelling business case for inclusivity and diversity within organizations. There's tons and tons of research that shows how greater levels of diversity in a variety of ways within organizations increases creativity and innovation and productivity uh, diversity on boards uh, helps the performance of the organization, diversity in teams, so on and so forth. Like there's so much evidence, so much research, research that, sh that creates this business case. We just have to effectively communicate that um, repeatedly to make sure that everyone keeps their, their eye on the ball uh, and we don't allow ourselves to slip back into the old patterns and tendencies. Um, you know, coming back to you know, how do we help people become more self-aware? I mean, ultimately, you can't force anyone to be aware of something and act on something that they aren't willing to uh, acknowledge is in existence. You, I can't, it, it's just like as a leader, I can't actually motivate anybody to do anything. 
um, I can create an environment in which people can be be fulfilled and find motivation to do things. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose I can compel people. I can use fear tactics. I can use threats. Um, I can use um, I can use negative emotion to compel people to do things. But that's only a short term kind of motivation. That's not what we're talking about. When we're talking about like long term sustainable motivation, that only comes from within. And I can't force anyone to be motivated in that way. But I can, as a leader, help create a context, a, a, an environment where people can feel supported to, to um, find fulfillment in their work and, and find their own intrinsic motivations. Same thing with awareness, same thing with helping people understand the necessity of, of equity and inclusivity and diversity. Um, you know, I, I can't force people to take the veil off their face and acknowledge something, um, but I can create the environment. I can take away problematic policies, practices, and procedures that restrict and inhibit the ability for people to, to both be aware, but then also reinforce positive behaviors within the organization. Uh, and I can consistently have it as a point of discussion, as a point of continual dialogue, um, where we can challenge ourselves to think, you know, where are we at? Uh, what what improvements have we made? Where are we still falling short? And what can we continue to do to improve? There's no magic bullet and there's no easy fix to this. It's hard work. And it just requires consistent awareness, consistent effort um, to make uh, small, small incremental improvements. And I believe, I truly believe that it's very possible to do within organizations, um, but we have to be willing to put in the hard work um, we have to be willing to have some level of discomfort we have to be willing um, to 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 raise the level of support for people who are really struggling you know if i if i was a a, a manager and i had uh, people of color on my team I, I i would need to know i would need to get outside of myself enough to know that right now they're probably struggling in ways that I can't quite comprehend or understand. And I don't need to necessarily completely comprehend or understand it, but I need to recognize that this could be a hard time for them and provide extra, extra support uh, for them uh, so that they can be healthy within my team and within my organization. Yeah. And think about how easy that is. It starts, it starts with a little bit of listening a desire to be aware of, of how your people are doing and then trusting in what they have to say. You know, if, if somebody, if somebody has the ability to open up to you and say something to you and you don't want to see it, you don't want to know it. Like, I guess, I guess it all comes back down to, well, how the hell do you think any of this is going to end? You know, you look at poverty rates in the United States and First Nations people is 28%. African Americans are over 20%. And you can put a positive spin on those things and say, well, that's, you know, 70 something percent, that's 80 something. No, that's a lot. And then you have another 10% of, of whites are poor. Another 10% of Asians are poor. Like, where do you think any of that is going to end? Where do you think discrimination, like, it's not going to end well. And so I don't even need to take somebody who has these nasty feelings and thoughts inside of their heart, even their biases. I just need, I don't need them to even believe different things at this point. I just need them to accept the fact that the way that they're doing things doesn't work. And if you just improve it, you'll improve the lives of people and you'll improve your own organization and operation. And I believe then, then that's when the hearts change. I believe the hearts and minds change that way. I don't believe that I can take somebody who is fearful and racist and let's say homophobic. I don't think that I can just change that person by saying, you're wrong in the way that you feel, and here's why. I believe that 
is only through exposure of their own self-interest on why that behavior doesn't work. And they themselves going, yeah, you know, it isn't, you know, my bottom line's kind of getting screwed here. I have people completely boycotting my business. I have people jumping ship left and right. My retention rate completely sucks. You know, and even if they have to bite their lip in the beginning, because their biases are just so ingrained, I believe that when they see the benefit to them, that they themselves will have an absolute change of heart. And isn't that really what we want in the end? Isn't, isn't what we want in the end for our organizations and our leaders is for them to see both their positions of power and privilege in this world and to have the way that they navigate their organizations and people to change. And so if our goal is to make them change, then why don't we, why don't we go at it the way that we know works? We know, we know that this recipe works. Like we know it works. The other way doesn't work. And so can, because they've had this stuff ingrained in them since they were young too. A lot of times people who are tragically homophobic, okay, they've lived around, say, homophobia their entire life. They grew up with it. They listened to the slang. Their grandfather, their grandparents, their parents maybe even use it, their friends. So you're not going to change them because by going at them head on, you're actually attacking their past. But when you can start showing them different pathways, I believe, and now exposure, I believe that you can change. Yeah. You know, and we, I, and I, I think that, this. yeah, I think that exposure uh, is so, so key. Um, it, it's good to have a working vocabulary, a working understanding of the concepts, uh, but people who have deep ingrained, you know, prejudices or even implicit biases, um, it, it takes that exposure. It takes the building of awareness over time for your heart to change. Well, Eric, it has been a pleasure uh, talking with you about awareness, awareness of self, of others within our organizations as leaders, what we can do um, uh, to try to, to make a safe place uh, where everyone feels valued, they, they feel needed, wanted, that they have equal opportunity to, to contribute. Um, we need to be aware of our surrounding context in order to do that. And we can build awareness over time if we put effort into it. Um, and so that's my hope for everyone who's listening today that will, will consider, you know, what, what's one thing we can do today? What's one thing we can do, um, to help make things a little bit better for the people we lead? Um, how can we, um, increase our own awareness, whether that be through some education or putting ourselves out there to be in contact with those that maybe we're not normally in contact with so we can experience things the way they experience them, put our, ourselves in their shoes a little bit. As we consider those things, I think we will be able to move um, the needle and we're going to be able to, to uh, help things improve both in society at large, but also within our organizations. Um, Eric, I'll give you the final word. No, I, I like, I like what you had to say. I, I, I think, I think let's just, let's just ask ourselves, you know, what does this world look like in five, in five years, in 10 years, if we keep allowing people to be marginalized and more and more, and I'm talking all people at this point, and more and more people just fall to zero. Like, what, what do you think? You think those, those prior special forces soldiers that you have surrounding your family, that are going to take you to your escape bunker? Those people have families and they have extended families and they'll protect you in good times. But when it all falls, they're going to eat you first. It is in your best interest to care about the most vulnerable in society. It is the third pragmatic question that Greenleaf asks. And you have to be aware that the plight of people in this country is completely different from those of us that have been given a lot of privilege. And when you recognize that, you realize that the society, when it falls apart, do you really want Mad Max? I don't want Mad Max. I don't want to see that. And that's what happens when everybody falls to zero in the handful. Yeah. 
Well, wonderful. Uh, thanks again, Eric, uh, for the discussion today. Uh, I hope our, our listeners will continue to tune in and, and listen to all the great uh, interviews and, and, and leadership tidbits and thoughts, and as well as our, our weekly discussions uh, about COVID, our weekly discussions about servant leadership. Uh, hopefully we continue to add value for you and you'll uh, continue to, to come on and, and see what we're putting out. Uh, thanks, Eric, for joining me. Um, thanks to the listeners for being here. And we hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us.